Good morning, Professor Ruffin. My name is Gabby, and I'm a rising junior at Wellesley College. And I'm so excited to interview you for our Q2 um, faculty interviews. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourself, and we can get started with the questions. Terrific. I'm so happy to be able to contribute to this series for the Davis Museum. And my name is Catherine Ruffin, and I'm the director of the Book Studies Program and a lecturer in art at Wellesley College. Amazing. So the first question I have for you is, what did you learn as an undergrad that still influences your artistic practice today? That's a terrific question, and it's hard for me to think about my undergraduate experience without thinking also about high school and my graduate school experiences. So let me give you a little bit of an arc of an answer, and I'll really focus on my undergraduate career. I went to public high schools in Alabama, and I had a wonderful art teacher in high school who really influenced me. And I did a lot of mail art and a lot of zines when I was in high school. And I actually sent a lot of mail art to a woman at Bryn Mawr College who was an admissions officer. And when I flew to Bryn Mawr College to do an admissions interview, and I walked into this woman's office, her name is Libby Mosier. She graduated from Bryn Mawr in 1984 and we're still in touch. Um, when I walked into her office for my interview and I saw that she had put my mail up art in her office, was on the walls and the bulletin board, I thought, wow, I hope this interview goes well, because I think I've got a really good shot of being admitted to this really uh, elite and competitive seven siblings college. And I was admitted to Bryn Mawr, and I did have the good fortune and privilege of going there and doing an undergraduate degree in philosophy. While I was studying philosophy and fulfilling all of my other requirements, I also did a lot of work in the college theater with a wonderful professor named Mark Lord, who did a lot of really innovative collaborative work in which he questioned the canon. So for instance, we did a version of Death of a Salesman in which we had seven or eight different women playing the part of Willie Loman, and one of them was actually a vampire. So <laughs> in the early 1990s, this was really amazing uh, college student theater work to be doing. So that, um, innovation in the arts within the liberal arts and working in a collaborative setting was really important for me and i also did a lot of study with hiroshi iwasaki mm -hmm. who's since passed away he was the set designer who collaborated with mark lord i studied dance and did a lot of history of dance as well as active dance and um, i also did a lot of writing and uh, studied poetry with maggie holly who was an amazing influence on me. And I also did a lot of creative literary publishing with others, both formally and informally zines and literary journals while I was at Bryn Mawr. So all of that was really wonderful and really informs what I bring to the Wellesley College environment because I was starting to make books when I was a student at Bryn Mawr, but I didn't have anybody like me to teach me how to do it. So I was sort of figuring out in a very primitive way how to make artist books on the floor of my dorm room. <laughs> and um, so I think a lot about what I needed as a Bryn Mawr student looking back and then what I was able to get from the wonderful professors and mentors I had and try to put all of that together in the way I serve the Wellesley College community. I also, after Finishing Bryn Mawr had the good fortune to go on and do a master's in fine arts in the book arts at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. I did that immediately after Bryn Mawr and I studied with a very charismatic and uh, influential teacher named Steve Miller. And then later when I was actually working at Wellesley, I did a part-time doctoral program in library and information science at Simmons University. And I had a terrific set of faculty there and a dissertation advisor, Michelle Clunan, who five years after I finished my PhD is still sending me smart, supportive emails. So I've been really lucky from high school through a doctoral program to have amazing people to study with. And the way that they have nurtured me and encouraged me influences the way that I work with students at Wellesley. 
That's amazing. I love, I love that, that academic journey that's kind of, you know, brought you from high school all the way to, you know, post-grad, especially I love that anecdote about seeing your artwork um, up in the admissions wall at Bryn Mawr. I think it, it must be, you know, a very important for any artist, you know, when you, when you kind of see your artwork um, kind of, you know, put up with uh, other people that, you know, you don't know, but that must have been an amazing experience. Um, Great. My second question is, how does your teaching influence your art and vice versa? I think, as you said, um, you were both working on your bookbinding and um, paper making art craft, but then at the same time, you know, um, you were studying philosophy. I, could you speak a little bit about that and um, anything, anything else you, you think would um, add to it? Sure. And, and let me just also add to the response to my first question and in response to your comment that anytime I meet a student at Wellesley who's beginning their Wellesley career and they've come from a public high school education background and they're a little uncertain about do they fit at Wellesley, I try to encourage them because I came to Bryn Mawr with an uneven high school preparation and look where I've ended up. So I always want to support and encourage those first generation students or students who are coming from a place of uh, uneven academic preparation because I think so much is possible at Wellesley um, and there's so many amazing resources. So to answer your question as to how my teaching and artistic practice relate, I really have a, a teaching practice that embraces uh, the creative hands-on work that I do in paper making in Pendleton West and in letterpress printing and bookbinding in the Book Arts Lab in Clapp Library. And I really also have a deep interest not only in hands-on work and craft and labor, but in research and research methods. And I am fortunate in Clapp Library in Library and Technology Services to work closely with a crack team of research librarians. We've got amazing librarians at Wellesley and I sort of bridge the worlds of the library and the art department. Um, and one of the reasons that that works so well for me is that I don't really differentiate between critical and creative inquiry. I'm a big believer in research looking at original objects and books, which we have so many wonderful examples in the Davis Museum and in the um, Wellesley Library. So for me, it sort of all is part of a whole and I find that drawing little distinctions and lines and boundaries is not constructive. It's better to be an omnivore and just expose yourself to anything that's interesting and inspiring to you, compelling to you, and then figuring out how intellectually, creative, spiritually, you can process that and perhaps share it with others in a constructive way. Amazing. And I'm sure that I know a lot of you, I, know that for a lot of um, our students, especially I'm sure also in the book arts lab, that um, this this kind of practice really helps the student, you know, um, kind of a um, an approach to learning. But also, I think one of the great things about um, your work is that it's also exercise in seeing, right, in addition to um, being in like a formal classroom environment, but kind of reworking where those boundaries are um, and understanding how to kind of expand the classroom uh, beyond what it traditionally is thought of. Yeah, and it, I think that's a wonderful observation. And in our liberal arts experiential learning model, which we're so good at Wellesley at doing and what we're, we're now adopting to being in a, in a more remote kind of learning situation, I think in some very innovative ways, is that you can go look at the object, you can go study the rare book, you can see the painting at the Davis Museum, and then within five minutes you can be in a studio setting where you're trying to respond to that by making something. Um, and I think that that's a wonderful opportunity. And even if you're not majoring in the arts or humanities, it's going to enrich you as a thinker and as a citizen and hopefully make you a lifelong learner who's sensitive to the arts in the broader world. And I think that's that's something we do really well at Wellesley College. That, that was very eloquently said, thank you. And I mean, um, I guess also moving on to the actual exhibit itself. So the Davis Mounts a faculty exhibition every five years. And how did you decide what to include in Q20? 
I was so pleased with the invitation to participate in this exhibition. And of course, the Davis Museum has such beautiful galleries and the opportunity to create something special to be shown there um, with such amazing work by other colleagues it was a real privilege. And I think a lot about the arts and crafts movement, which underpins a lot of the book arts world. William Morris and his Calm Scout Press are always in the background of our minds as we're making limited edition or unique books that are responding to more industrial and commercial pressures in our world. Those, those William Morris themes come up a lot. And I actually have a very overdue William Morris book out from the art library that I need to get back to campus. Um, so I was thinking about the origins of the arts and crafts movement. And I thought about John Ruskin, a British social critic, art critic, who did writing that actually influenced William Morris. And so thinking about what are the origins of the arts and crafts movement, the fact that William Morris would read passages from Ruskin's The Seven Lamps of Architecture to his friends struck me as interesting. So I thought, well, I better read this book. And it's a sort of rant, ramble, very dense, very hard to read, 250 page long book about Gothic architecture. And Ruskin is going and looking at buildings. He's trying to describe them. He's trying to understand the principles that guided their makers. And I'm very interested these days when there are discussions about um, the development of vaccines. This is like a moonshot. This is like building medieval uh, cathedrals. Wow, that Gothic architecture uh, has been in the back of my mind for a while. So I read the Ruskin book. I looked for passages that were really important and I created this series of prints about beauty, power, life that are that are on display as single framed broadsides a series of seven representing the seven lamps mm -hmm. since i've been teaching and working here in my home studio and i am very fortunate to have my own printing press behind me where i created the ruskin prints this has been a great resource for remote teaching um, i've been continuing to experiment with those broadsides and to transform them so this project continues to feel Awesome. strong and powerful to me. Truth, everybody wants integrity. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, so I've transformed the prints into an accordion fold book and I've been enjoying sort of re-exploring this series of prints that I made from uh, with letterpress printing using wood and metal type and using the printing press you see behind me, transforming those into book form. And then I've also been playing with making them into more sculptural forms. So can I make these into lamps or lanterns of some kind that then uh, respond even more literally to the seven lamps of architecture title? So I'm pleased with the project in a lot of ways. One, it's great to have it up at the Davis, but two, it's been a project that over time, as our world has changed a lot in the past seven or eight months, still has resonance for me. And I still want to work on these ideas and I'm experimenting hands-on with transforming it in a way that feels compelling and satisfying. So I think that's a, a good sign that it was a worthy project. Yes, and I honestly, I, thank you for that little, that demo. I mean, those are, that's a, a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And I think um, you're definitely very, very lucky to have um, a bookbinding press um, where you are. So that's amazing. Uh, like you talked about earlier, which is, um, you know, the dialogue between um, Ruskin and Moore, but also the dialogue between you and your students. Um, my next question is about how have your students impacted your craft um, and maybe just generally what have you learned um, by being an educator and by your students at Wellesley College or um, in any other kind of academic setting? That's a wonderful question and I, I think Wellesley students have had a very positive and powerful impact on my life. I've been affiliated with the college and been teaching in the Book Arts Lab since the year 2000. And so having that two decades of constant exposure to bright inquiring minds who want to make the world a better place, who want to serve in that classic um, interpretation of the Wellesley mission, who want to learn all they can and take as much advantage of the college's resources in the 
eight semesters that they're part of the college community, it keeps me sharp. It keeps me questioning my own um, thoughts and assumptions. I am so privileged to have had the span of time in which to be in constant dialogue with Wellesley students because we've had so many changes with respect to the history of communication and mass communication in the past 20 years and navigating the way that our world is becoming more digital in partnership with Wellesley students has been extremely powerful for me. And I'm at this moment in time, especially engaged with the 12 students who are taking my Arts 112 Intro to Book Studies class remotely, and we're collaboratively reading texts together, and we're uh, making books together at a distance, and we're really probing at this tension and the opportunities that are present as the analog and, and digital come together. And I think it's made me a stronger teacher and a stronger artist to have been part of the Wellesley community in the past 20 years. And we have amazing resources with Special Collections, with the Book Arts Lab, which celebrated its 75th anniversary in 2019. Um, and it's also been fun over the years to have some students who have really demonstrated special talent and affinity for the field and have gone on in the field. So for instance, Mary French, uh, who graduated in 09 in um, medieval and Renaissance studies is a book and paper conservator now. And she comes back as a visiting speaker in my classes. Robin Siddle, who just graduated in 2020 with a studio art major, is now working with Ken Botnick, a book artist in Western Mass who was the Cornell professor at Wellesley last year. So to have students who are, um, who have the focus, the intelligence, and the amazing humanity about which they go about their work in the book arts lab and then go on and make really significant contributions to the field is also something that is really um, gratifying and satisfying and makes me feel like Wellesley is tending to the pipeline in terms of cultural heritage. And we're sending a few really talented, really well-trained students out into the world to make a difference and to be the next generation of stewards of these amazing resources. Right, it's, it's definitely a transformative experience, I think both for the student and for the educator. I see, um, I guess with one, congratulations for your um, two decade anniversary, that's, that's great. Um, and, that also makes me wonder, um, which is how perhaps, you know, being in quarantine or, I don't know, perhaps just kind of state of the world. I know that everyone is really, um, or I guess you'll be teaching your arts class remotely. Um, so how has that been impacting your current practice or any current work, artwork that you're wor working on? Um, and if you'd like to speak a little bit about um, new projects or um, new inspirations that you've been having. Um, so, Terrific question, and it's given me the opportunity to sort of slow down a little bit because I'm somebody who runs all over campus, runs all over Boston. Um, so to settle down and be a little more grounded physically in my home studio, which I'm very privileged to have and which I assembled so I could have a place to really focus on my own projects. But over the past eight months has been an amazing resource for teaching because I can do so much here that I can do in the book arts lab and I have a, a multi-camera setup and it's it's something I've worked out to sort of broadcast things well via Zoom and I, I think it's going pretty well. Um, and so it's been a time in which I could do things like be innovative in my teaching practice, be grounded in my home studio, share that with others in a way that I would not have had we not had quarantine. And then I've also been able to revisit and try to transform some projects like the Ruskin project that I was showing you the model of. Um, and I've also returned to a project that I began in 2008, which is a nonpartisan get out the vote poster project. So this is letterpress printing as well, also done on my press. Let me grab a couple of examples. Yes, um, please. <laughs> So in this project, I print um, letterpress metal and wood type with some linoleum cuts. 
and I print these posters and then I just give them away to friends or I mail them to friends who live in other states. And sometimes if there's a swing state situation, I might mail a little cache of posters to someone in a swing state and ask them to give them away to other friends. And it, it truly is a nonpartisan project in which I'm simply encouraging people to vote because if you look at the numbers for our population and then how many people actually turn out and participate, it's very sobering, those numbers are low. And I value living in a liberal democracy and I want more people to participate. Um, and so I've also done a series this past couple of months on amendments that relate to voting. So there's the 19th amendment, which gave women the opportunity to vote. Um, and so I've also taken the opportunity to transform some of the proofs, wow. which were <laughs> imperfect. This, this spells election. Um, Amazing. Proofs that were imperfect. I sort of had, you know, extra time with my exacto knife while listening to Zoom presentations. <laughs> right. So I cut up old proofs and I made them into a book. And this says count and then has a little vote. So lots of different ways of circling back to projects and thinking about what might last the test of time. Vote with a little heart in the zero. And this is all about the peaceful transfer of power that persists in our democracy here in America. And I think that that art, if, if anything, we need it the most right now <laughs> in, in a world of just a lot of just turmoil. And I think that, you know, that if that's one thing that we can cling on to, that is, um, you know, our democracy, our liberal democracy. So those are all the questions that I have for you today. But thank you so much for sharing your artwork with me. And I'm so excited, um, hopefully when we're all in person again, to be able to um, all rejoin at the Davis and see the exhibition for ourselves. That would be lovely. And I hope everybody who uh, sees this and is intrigued can come and visit the Book Arts Lab in Clapp Library when we're back on campus and also come and see our paper making and printmaking, paper making and silkscreen studio in the basement of Pendleton West, which are the two places you'll find me in action. Amazing. Thank you.